You're French. I'm French. French and American now, but oh. yes. I was born uh, near Paris. I grew up near Paris oh. on the on the outskirts. In the banlieue, or, or yeah, yeah, uh, I, no, I, I, not I, that close. North, northwest, n you know, kind of. Soisy sous moment, Sillon, Galibin, Aubonne. This is kind of this area. I was always interested in engineering, science, and things like this. And I was interested in, uh, you know, at the abstract level, on the question of intelligence. You know, how did right. human intelligence appear? Um, what is intelligence really? So that's a question I was fascinated by since I was a kid, yeah. essentially. So that goes back a long time. You know, I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey when I was nine years old, and I th you know, I thought the concept of an intelligent machine was uh, was amazing. And that movie also put together uh, not not just intelligent machines, but how you know some hypothesis about how human intelligence evolved, right? Yeah. So that's right. so that was all the topic I was fascinated by. And what you see here in this room is that all this decoration. These are pictures from the oh, sure, 2001 yeah. movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, so that's how I got interested in this question. And you know, I always thought I could be a scientist or an engineer. My dad was an engineer, mechanical engineer. Um, <clears throat> I studied engineering, electrical yeah. engineering. And uh, I took a lot of uh, courses in, you know, applied math and physics and things that were kind of uh, fairly fundamental. And I started doing projects in, I guess, what you could call AI, I guess. Mm -hmm. I got interested in neuroscience also. And this is all in high school or this is now no, in this college? this is in college. Yeah, uh, and that was where? That was at a school called ESIW, which is uh, not a huge top you know, engineering school, right. you know, a decent engineering school for electrical engineering in Paris. Mm. Mm. Uh, that school since moved to east of Paris, like near Disney, you know, you're Disney. Sure. But back back then it was uh, in Paris in the 15th arrondissement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, and I did a bunch of research projects with various professors on sort of, you know, kind of computer models of neurons and stuff like that. And I, I, I I discovered the existence of learning machines by reading a philosophy book, actually. It was a debate mm. between uh, Noam Chomsky, the linguist, and Jean Piaget, the developmental psychologist. Sure. Yeah. And they were arguing about the you know, nature-nurture debate, right? And, uh, you know, is, is language acquired? Is it yeah. innate? I you just know, like that. had a conversation with Ken Church. Right. who was a student about all of this. Yeah. And he is a former colleague from Bell Labs, actually. Oh, that's um, right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I read this thing, and there was uh, one of the talks was uh, that was trans transcribed in that book was by uh, Seymour Papert from MIT, mm -hmm. where he was singing the praise of uh, a model called the perceptron, which I had never heard of before, um, which, you know, is one of the early yeah. kind of simple learning models, right, from the 50s and 60s. Um, so I, I read about this, and I said, a machine that's capable of learning, I find that absolutely fascinating. I always thought learning was indistinguishable or, or inseparable from from intelligence that you could not mm. you know I, yeah. I, I thought the task of building an intelligent machine was was impossible but building a machine that could learn maybe was yeah. a possibility right, right? Um, so I started digging the entire li literature I must have been in maybe third year of college or something what year would that be that would be 1980 1981 wow. yeah um, and then discovered uh, that Nobody was actually working on this anymore. The, the entire field had been abandoned in the late 60s because right. of a book co-authored yes. by the same guy, right? The Seymour Peppert, who was, you know... Oh, was that the Minsky book? The Minsky and Peppert oh, book. Oh, I didn't realize he was the co-author. Yeah, uh, right. So that pretty much killed the field. Yeah. Or at least had a big uh, impact on the, yeah. uh, on the field. Uh, and there it was, you know, he was 10 years later actually kind of praising the perceptron, you know, it's wow. kind, of, kind of interesting yeah. um, to argue against Chomsky's argument that language is innate. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I got interested in this and I, I, I thought, why, why is it that people abandon this idea? You know, it sounds like a really good, really cool idea. And then realized very quickly that what people were kind of, you know, the wall that people were hitting against at that time was that they knew that the Perceptron in itself was very limited, and you, 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 you know, there was a, a need for being able to kind of build multi-layer neural nets. Right. And they, they knew that. They just didn't figure out how to do it. Right. And it's probably mostly because they had the, the wrong neurons. The, the, the neurons people were using in neural nets at the time were binary neurons. Right. And that's incompatible with things like backprop. Right. Um, and so the idea didn't just, just didn't come up. 
even though the basic idea of doing backprop actually existed in the context of optimal control since the 60s. So, yeah. um, so you know, the whole field kind of died or rather changed name because instead of working on intelligent machines, the people working on the perception at the time and, and related models started renaming what they were doing. It was called adaptive filters and things like that, but it was the same thing really they were doing. Yeah. Um, and so I, I started thinking about, you know, how, how can we train multi-layer networks and kind of stumbled on an idea that, um, which was very close to backprop. So this must have been 1983 or so. Yeah. Uh, which was the idea of using the, the, the weights that are used in the neural net forward, yeah. you use them backwards. I wasn't using them to backpropagate gradient, I was using them to backpropagate targets. So basically to compute virtual targets for every neuron. Mm. Uh, my neurons were still binary. Mm. And the reason was the computers we had access to at the time were very slow at computing multiplications. Right. And so if you have binary neurons, you don't need to do multiplications. Um, and then uh, and then I talked to a, a friend of mine who was doing a, a PhD in, 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 in control in robotics, who told me about those methods that, you know, in robotics that people had, or in, in optimal control that people had come up, come up with in the 60s. And I said, like, that looks very much like the stuff I'm working on. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, and so that's when I kind of came up with backprop. But then, um, but then a month later, or so a couple months later, I met Jeff Hinton, who came to a, a meeting in France, mm. and he, we, we, I really wanted to meet him because he had written a paper on Boson machines, which I think was the, you know, it was it was the first paper I saw that basically allowed to train neural nets that had hidden units, right? right. So I thought that's, you know, I want to talk to him, right? Either him or Terry Sinowski. I actually met Terry a couple months earlier, mm. um, and so I meet. I meet um, Jeff uh, at this meeting in France, and, uh, and and we start talking, and I tell him what I'm working on. I had a, uh, a paper in the proceedings of the conference he came to that talked about this target prop idea, and he, he read it, and he said, that's really close to back prop. Uh, and so we talked together, and, and I told him what I was working on, which was back prop, and then he told me what he was working on, which was also back prop, and so you know, it oh, just totally amazing. lined up. Yeah. Uh, and he said, oh, I, I'm writing a paper, and you know, I'm going to cite your paper in mine. Uh, I was absolutely delighted by it. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and that's how, you know, that's how I met him. Was he uh, as prominent then in the, in the field? He was somewhat because of the Boston Machine paper, and mm. it, it was just the, the the beginning of the wave or the second wave of neural nets. Right. Uh, this is mid nineteen eighty five, so nobody knows about backprop yet. But mm. um, um, but Boston Machines have been around for a couple of years, and um, it was clear that there was you know there's going to be a lot of people kind of trying to kind of restart, yeah, you know, working on neural nets. Um, I mean, he, w he wasn't nearly as famous as he is now, of course, but. Um, but 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 he but he was kind of you know fairly well known. So um, so then he told me uh, I'm organizing a summer school next summer um, one year later and said you know um, um, I'm gonna invite you to that summer school and we're gonna bring together all the students who are working on neural nets and all that stuff. Uh, and that was sort of really sort of the, the founding event, if you want, of the sort of neural net community, really. That was in California. That was at Carnegie Mellon. Oh, Carnegie. He was at Carnegie Mellon yeah. at that time. That was in 1986, the one I'm talking about. Okay. So I was at uh, Université Pierre and Marie Curie, which now has a different name. Now it's called Sorbonne Université. But, right. uh, but I actually didn't spend much time at that school because uh, the... The person who was officially my advisor was a professor at that university, so that's where mm. I was officially registered. But I was actually spending most of my time in two labs. One was at the engineering school where I did my undergrad, because mm. that school happened to have fairly powerful computers for the time, mm. uh, which I could use, and uh, also in an independent lab where uh, my advisor spent some time and, and a few other people who had kind of a common interest in what they called automata networks, which was sort of connected with neural nets and uh, right. you know these people kind of got involved in neural nets uh, pretty uh, pretty pretty quickly so um, in 1987 I uh, I graduated this is just when uh, you know the backprop paper was you know had been published a year before the uh, net talk uh, mm -hmm. thing that Terry Sanowski built you know he kind of ran around and gave talks about this uh, all of a sudden you know the people in France who had been basically ignoring me for years 
uh, started talking to me because you know I was I was the local expert on those multi-layer right. nets, right? Right. Um, so I finished my PhD. Uh, Jeff was actually on my thesis committee, and then I did a postdoc. I started a postdoc with him in Toronto. So he mm -hmm. moved to Toronto from CMU. Right. In the summer of 1987, and I arrived in Toronto two weeks after him. I see. I see. Uh, yeah, so I, I, uh, I was invited in the winter of 1987 to uh, Montreal. I gave a talk there, and in the room was this, uh, this kid who asked really smart questions about, about neural nets. And there were very, very few people working on neural nets at the time. Uh, that was Joshua. <laughs> I kept an eye on him. <laughs> Was Sammy there by chance? I didn't meet Sammy until three years later, I think. Yeah, look, I just think it's fascinating. They're two brothers yeah. in this field. And then it turns out your brother works for... He works at Google. Google. Yeah, in <laughs> so, Paris. Yeah, he, amazing. He's, not, he's not working on machine learning. He's yeah, a, but still, it's A person's research, yeah. uh, optimization kind of person. Yeah, what did your parents do that they have these two brilliant kids doing stuff? Well, my, my mom was a homemaker. My... Uh, my dad was a mechanical engineer right. uh, working in the aerospace industry. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of a, a bit of a mechanical genius. I mean, oh. my brother and I learned everything from him, basically. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> you know, when we were kids, we were like, you know, build model airplanes and, you know, electronics and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, what so. was your first computer? Oh, my first computer I bought when I was still in high school. This was in 1977. Yeah. I'm sorry. So this was before you could buy a computer with a screen and a keyboard, yeah, right? This right. was a single board computer, uh, which had, um, it was just a, you know, a printed circuit board right. with a 6502 microprocessor, 1K of RAM, uh, 4K of RAM or something, an hexadecimal, you know, keyboard and LED display with six digits, you know, the right. seven segments, six digits. And you would program it directly in, in, in machine language, you know, in hexadecimal. What, who was the maker? Um, it was a company called MOS Technologies. Oh, um, so not... Synertech, actually. The, the company that made the board was called uh, Synertech. Synertech. Yeah. I don't know how you pronounce yeah. it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, it didn't last very long. But, yeah. um, um, but you know, you, you basically had to know, like, how a microprocessor worked inside to be able to program those things. You know, there was no, you know, high-level language or basic or whatever, right? It was yeah. directly... Yeah, um, uh, machine language uh, to program into, and uh -huh. my my main motivation for getting into this was two things, you know, long term AI, whatever, but short term music. I was into oh, really? electronic music, oh, uh, not just electronic music in general, yeah. and I wanted to use computers for music essentially. And and the music thing faded, or did you do it no, on the side? It didn't fade really. I, um, I mean, I have a bunch of analog synthesizers and various other things, and I build. Uh, wind controller. I'm a I'm a wind oh, really? wind uh, 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 instrument player. So like which instruments? Uh, you know, like oboe recorder oh, and various uh, exotic uh, Renaissance instruments. So, but I, I build wind controllers. You know, f um, so you yeah. can blow into them. You know, it sort of figures out your fingering and and there's sort of various controls and and so there's there's a bunch that I just bought and there's a bunch that I built. Wow, so. fascinating. Uh, okay, so so. Fast forward, then uh, th there was a moment when neural nets died again, largely because of insufficient hardware, I think. And then, and that was the point at which you, Jeffrey, that's why everyone talks about the three of you together, right? Didn't you come together and sort of revitalize the field? It's, it's slightly more complicated than that. So uh, there was like a, you know, a very favorable period in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so I joined Bell Labs in the late 80s. Uh, I hired Joshua, actually, uh, oh. at Bell Labs. He worked there for a few years uh, with us, uh, early the first half of the 90s. Uh, and other people like Leon Botou and Patrice Simard. I mean, a bunch of, you know, Vladimir Vapnik was in our, our group, too. I mean, those are kind of big names yeah. in, the, in the community. Um, and... Um, and we became really successful with the techniques we developed, convolutional nets. You know, we kind of were able to build systems that could read uh, checks and zip codes and various other things. And the engineering divisions of the company right. actually commercialized that. Yeah, so I remember that was that. quite yeah. successful. But just at the time that we started being successful commercially in uh, 1995, roughly, two things happened. First, the machine learning community lost interest in neural nets. And the second thing is that AT&T which you know, right, broke up. when yeah. Bell Labs broke itself up, yeah, uh, for the second time, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, and that was 
a bit difficult for, for me because um, when the company broke up, the, the research group where I was in stayed with AT&T. So that took the name AT&T Labs. The reason being that the guy in charge of, the, who be, became in charge of Bell Labs uh, didn't like machine learning at all. So all the machine learning people went to AT&T. Yeah. Uh, the engineering group was in Lucent Technologies, which was one right. of the spin-offs. And the product group was in NCR, which was yet another uh, right. uh, spin-off. And so the whole project was basically disbanded. So I, you know, this was like my biggest technical success, uh, as well as technology transfer success. And all of a sudden, it was taken, taken away from me almost on the same day that we were celebrating its, wow. uh, uh, its deployment, essentially. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I was promoted to department head. So now I had to also run a lab. Yeah. And this was the early days of the internet, so basically I kind of tried to figure out what, what I should do next. Um, yeah. And for six years, essentially didn't work on machine learning at all. I wrote papers on stuff we did before, mm -hmm. but uh, I started a new project called Deja Vu, DJVU, that was sort of a image compression technology mm -hmm. that was somewhat successful at some point. Um, and then ran the, the department until early 2002 when I left at and and that's, that's when I restarted working on machine learning, deep learning, et cetera. And that's just about when Yeshua, Jeff, and I kind of got together and sort of started the, the deep learning conspiracy, if you want. <laughs> yeah, and where were you then when, when, when you left at &T? So I left at and went to the NEC Research Institute in Princeton. Right. Uh, I stayed there for about 18 months. Uh, I brought a lot of people from my lab there, uh, about four, four people, from mm -hmm. five people actually from my lab from at and uh, Leon Botou and Bernier Vapnik and uh, Eric Cosato, Hospital Graph, and a couple other people. And um, but then I only stayed 18 months because NEC basically was kind of in a very sort of complicated transition period, and they were not interested in the like all the people I I wanted to work with at the NEC Research Institute were leaving. Uh, yeah. They were you know physicists, uh, neuroscientists, uh, quantum physicists, and you know all the interesting people kind of started leaving. So I, th no, I started looking for another gig, and that's when I, I joined NYU. That was in 2003. Oh, is that right? I yeah. didn't realize you'd been here that long. Yeah. yeah. So, so a lot of the really uh, important work has been done at NYU? Uh, yeah, so I mean, a, a lot of the foundational work was done right. when I was in Toronto and Bell Labs right. uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and then I, I kind of restarted working on this at NEC, but really sort of uh, the more recent work, yeah, was uh, all yeah. done at NYU since 2002. So can you talk about the importance of learning representations in neural nets? I mean, neural nets depend on representations, so that's the whole point. All of AI re relies on representations. The question is, where do those representations come from? So. Uh, the classical way to build a pattern recognition system was was to build what's called a, a feature extractor, which you know turns the input signal, that's, whether it's an image or audio or whatever, into a representation, generally a vector, a list of numbers, right. that represent the salient features of the input that are useful for the task that you're trying to do. Right. So if you're trying to do speech recognition, you want some representation that takes into account the nature of the sound that is being pronounced, but doesn't care about the identity of the speaker, for example, or the pitch yeah. of the voice, right? Unless it's Chinese. Um, if you want to do speaker recognition, like figure out who is speaking, but you don't care about what, what is being spoken, then it's other features that you need to extract from the input. Um, same for images, right? If you want to uh, recognize the, an object in the image, there are certain features that are probably useful to extract. But people had, for things like uh, like image recognition, people have been working on the problem of what are the right features for recognizing objects. And there was no real good way of extracting features that would be general for any recognition problem that you had. So people had there's a whole lot of papers on what features you should extract if you want to recognize and written digits and other features you should extract if you want to recognize like a chair from a table or something or detect and, and, and that was just based on trial and error or intuition? Intuition, engineering, you know, a little bit of theory, but but mostly, you know, signal processing methods yeah. and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, in computer vision that means that means edge detection, things like right. that, you know, in uh, audio processing for representing speech, for example, that means doing Fourier transform to extract the spectral content and then doing some operations on it. 
Um, so, you know, every specialty had its own way of extracting features to represent the input signal. Right. And, and most people spend their entire career trying to figure out, you know, what are good ways to extract features. Um, so the idea of uh, multi-layer neural nets is that you can, you can think of the first layers are as the first few layers as extracting features for the following layers to right. use um, and, and classify if it's a classifier. Um, and if you can train the entire thing end-to-end, -end, that means the system learns its own features. You don't have to engineer the features anymore. It, you know, they just emerge from the, the learning process. So that, that, that's what was really appealing to me. And, and the idea that um, there's necessarily some sort of you know, hierarchical structure in those features. Uh, and the reason why you need some sort of hierarchy is because the perceptual world, like the natural yeah. data, is compositional in the sense that uh, you know, pixels kind of assemble to form edges, for example, and mm -hmm. edges assemble to form motifs like corners and crosses and things like this, mm -hmm. uh, or gratings. And then those motifs assemble to form kind of more complex shapes like circles and squares. And those assemble to form parts of objects, and those assemble to form objects, etc. So you have this sort of natural compositional hierarchy. And it's the same in uh, speech. Uh, you have, you know, raw signal, and then phones, phonemes, words, mm -hmm. uh, sentences, etc. Uh, you have the same in text. Uh, just about any natural language, you have this sort of composition, mm -hmm. compositional hierarchy because the world is compositional. Mm -hmm. um, and the visual cortex also has these layers. That's right. That uh, is that right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I mean, there's anatomical layers and these functional layers. So here we're talking about the functional layers, right? right. So the, the the visual signal goes from your retina to a little piece of the brain at the bottom called LGN, and then it goes to the back of the brain, V1, V2, V4, IT, and IT, the infotemporal cortex, is where objects are encoded, object categories are encoded. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, some neurons will fire when you look at uh, a chair, regardless of what chair it is, if it's occluded or not, if, you know, what type, what orientation, what color, what, it doesn't yeah. matter, right? So that's called invariant representation. But there is a, a hierarchy of components, right? Yeah. It starts, there, there are neurons that fire when it, when it sees a cross or when it sees an edge. Right. And then that gradually is built up. So this is the, this called the ventral pathway hierarchy, right? V1, V2, V4, IT. This, these are the, the, the yeah. four big, uh, you know, visual cortex areas that are used for uh, kind of recognition of, of objects in the, in the visual field. Uh, that's only five layers. I mean, there's more kind of internal layers sure. if you want. Um, and so the, ne the next question uh, I asked myself very early on, uh, before even I, I got to Toronto, uh, when I was finishing my PhD, is uh, can we build a network whose architecture would be somewhat inspired by the, what we know of the, the visual cortex? Mm -hmm. There was very classical work from the 60s by Hubel and Wiesel on the architecture yeah. of the visual cortex, right? Simple cells, complex cells, et cetera. Um, and uh, it was a very natural idea, and which people already had in the 60s of uh, connecting neurons to a small area in the visual field, so they detect local features and things yeah. like this, right? Um, and I built neural nets like this, you know, before even I came up with Backprop that, you know, tried to kind of reproduce this kind of architecture with the crude software tools I had mm -hmm. available. Um, so what I set out to do when I got in Toronto was uh, I'd started a project of, an ambitious project of writing a neural net simulator with Léon Botou, whom I met uh, just before I left France. And we, we started uh, writing a neural net simulator together uh, called SN, which turned out to be very instrumental in allowing us to do the experiments with early convolutional nets and things mm -hmm. like this. Um, you need, you know, at the time you, need a, you needed a lot of investment in software to be able to do those things. There was no MATLAB, there was no Python, there was no, you know, you, you basically had to write everything yeah. yourself, right? We even write our own. We even had to write our own Lisp interpreter. So, mm. um, so anyway, uh, I, I I get to Toronto. I, f I work on this software. Leon wrote, writes on the, you know keeps uh, working on this software on this on this side as well. Um, and then you know finally I can try um, convolutional nets. Um, and and it's based on the idea that. I was inspired by you know papers by uh, Kuniko Fukushima on the neurocognitron, where he had tried to kind of build also a model of the cortex using mm -hmm. those simple cells, complex cell hierarchy idea. Um, and this model was a little 
overly complicated. He was, he was trying to stick to, to kind of the neuroscience and the biology. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, there's a lot of, you know, things to adjust in his model to make it work. It was uh, a little Byzantine in, in many ways. He didn't have back props, so he couldn't train it end to end. Mm. Um, he had to come up with some sort of unsupervised running algorithm for it. Um, so what I set out to do was uh, basically, you know, build um, one of those kind of visual hierarchical model inspired by Hubble and Weasel, but trained into a backprop that was conventional nets. Mm. So this started working in the spring of 1988 when I was still in Toronto. Did some early experiment there, and then I moved to Bell Labs. And at Bell Labs, they had a big data set of a big data set of mm. 9,000 training samples of you know zip code digits. And I tried it. You know, my code was ready. I just tried it on the data set, and within two months, I had you know better results than anybody else. Wow. So uh, neural nets learn the representations. You don't have to prepare the representations yeah. and then put them in as inputs. Right. So because yeah. of this multi-layer structure, and in the case of convolutional nets, because of the, the local nature of those uh, right. neurons, they only look at a, a small thing, then it exploits this uh, compositional nature of, uh, of natural signals, if you want. Yeah. Um, and you know, a lot of it was intuition. Some of it was a little bit of biological uh, inspiration. Uh, of course, the whole idea of convolution and, and pooling and things like this are very classical things in single processing. You know, mm -hmm. orthogonal to machine learning, right? Um, and since then, there's been theoretical work that kind of show that this kind of architecture is a good idea for certain types of uh, of, of signals, you can you can prove it, okay. But but back then, you know, it was more kind of based on the yeah. yeah. There is a limit to what you can apply deep learning to today, due to the fact that you need uh, a lot of labeled data to yeah. train them, and so it's only economically feasible when you can collect that data and you can actually label it properly. Uh, and that's only true for a relatively small number of applications. Um, so that's one mode of training, right? Supervised learning. It works great for you know categorizing objects and images, for translating from one language to another if you have lots of parallel text. Uh, it you know it works great for speech recognition if you have collected enough data. Um, but it doesn't work for all kinds of stuff. Like it doesn't work for translating every language into every other language because we don't have parallel text for every language, right. every pair of language. It's very important for Facebook. People use you know thousands of languages on Facebook, and we don't have parallel data for every pair of language. Hmm. Um, it's very important also for a lot of areas where it's very expensive to collect data, like medical images, for example. Um, you will never have enough data. For, and then there is a lot of situations where collecting data is just not the right thing, so, or, or is not sufficient. For example, if you want to train a system to hold a dialogue with someone, you cannot just collect a training set and train the system to hold a dialogue. You actually have to train it to, with people, like talking with yeah. people, right? Um, if you want to train a system to interact with an environment, you have to have an environment in which it can train itself to interact. So that's one problem. The second problem is there is a second type of learning called reinforcement learning, which has gathered a lot mm. of uh, press uh, yeah. lately because, I you know. Met Richard Sutton at uh, in yeah, Montreal. Yeah, so yeah. Richard Sutton is one of the founders of this uh, area. And uh, it's sort of a weaker form of learning in the sense that uh, you can rely on the, instead of telling the system, here is the correct answer, you only tell, tell the system you're right or you're wrong, or you give it a, a number that corresponds to how right or wrong you think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and that number you know, can be generated automatically by the environment. So for example, you, know, you want to learn to ride a bike. If you, if you fall, that's a negative reinforcement. If you keep riding the bike for another second, that's a small positive uh, uh, reward if you want. Right? So by trying to figure out the sequence of action that maximizes the reward, then you know, maybe you'll, you'll learn to, do, to ride a bike. Um, here's a problem, though. Any human is almost any human is capable of learning to drive a car in about 30 hours of training with hardly any supervision. If you were to use reinforcement learning, at least in its current form, to uh, get a car to drive itself, <laughs> it would have to crash thousands of times. Yeah. It would have to drive hundreds of thousands of hours, if not million, yeah. crash thousands of times, kill many pedestrians, destroy itself multiple times, run off cliffs multiple times before it figures out how not to do it. Yeah. 
Um, and so what that tells you is that um, we're missing something really essential in human and animal learning uh, that is not reflected in the, the type of reinforcement learning or supervised, supervised learning that our machines can do, right? right? A kid can learn uh, you know, ten, the, the, the meaning of 10 new words per, per day, um, can figure out what an elephant is with just two pictures, right? And we can do this to some extent with learning today using transfer learning. You pre-train the machine to, with lots of images, and then you can retrain it to recognize new objects with very few samples. But, um, but there is something we're missing. Mm -hmm. And one hypothesis that I have, and you know, Joshua agrees, and Jeff has been saying this for 30 years or more, is that that thing should be unsupervised learning, um, which means just learn how the world works, uh, just learn the dependencies, the structure, the regularity of the world by observing it. Um, so I have a form of it called self-supervised learning, which is a very natural idea. Um, imagine that you, you, you give the machine a piece of input. Let's imagine it's a video clip, for example. You mask a piece of the video clip and you ask the machine, pretend you don't know this and you know, try to predict uh, what is masked from what you're seeing. So predict the future of this video clip, what's gonna happen in that video from what you can see from the past. Mm -hmm. or, um, or here is an image, I'm gonna block a piece of it, like can you reconstruct that piece? Um, in the context of text, you give it a, a window of, I don't know, a thousand words on a, on a text, and you take out 20% of the words, and you ask the system, can you predict what words are missing? And so when the machine trains itself to do this kind of filling in the blanks, it has to develop some representation of, of the data so it can do this job. Yeah. So to be able to predict what's going to happen in a video, you kind of have to understand you know, that there are objects that move independently of backgrounds and there are objects that are animate other than that are inanimate. The inanimate objects have predictable trajectories, the other ones don't. Yeah. Right? Things like that, right? Um, and so presumably by training a system to predict or filling in the blanks, it's, it's going to have to understand a lot about the structure of the world. And so the idea is that you would train a system in this self-supervised manner with tons and tons of data. Uh, there's no limit to how many YouTube videos you can make the machine watch. Uh, it will distill some representation of the world out of this. And then what you would do is when, whenever a, a particular task comes in, like learning to drive a car or recognizing particular objects, you use that representation as input to a classifier and you train that classifier supervised. So that's the, that's the whole idea. And in fact, this is an idea that uh, Jeff Yeshua and I actually started with uh, when, we, when we got together to kind of restart the, um, to start the deep learning conspiracy, you know, around 2003, mm -hmm. 2004. The idea was to use unsupervised learning to pre-train a network and then fine tune it using supervised learning. Because we had this idea that it was very difficult and perhaps hopeless to train a very, very large, very deep network using backprop. It wouldn't work. Mm. So the idea was, you know, we would pre-train it using those kind of unsupervised methods. And so Jeff worked on Boson machines, Joshua worked on Boson machines and you know, using autoencoders and various other things, and I worked on sparse autoencoders. There's sort of various methods that we proposed to do this until we realized with all the, tw the, the tweaks that we developed in the process, uh, like, you know, rectifying nonlinearities and draw pattern and things like that, that in fact you could train very deep, very large neural nets um, um, with backprop from scratch mm. if you had GPUs. <laughs> <laughs> so the hope is that by, by training a system to, you know, in this, kind of, uh, in this kind of way, the kind of representation that would be extracted would be sort of more complete, if you want, less, mm -hmm. less degenerate. And the kind of representations that are learned when you just train a machine to, you know, for a particular task, right? Whether when you train a machine for a particular task, it just learns the features that are useful for that particular task. Right. In fact, uh, one thing that that became clear um, um, pretty pretty quickly was that the best way to train a, a convolutional net is not to train it to distinguish one class from from another, like with two classes. Like you right. know, if you want to train a neural net to do. I don't know, pedestrian detection, right? So you have images with a pedestrian and images without. That's just a two-class problem. Um, it doesn't work that well. It works okay. You can beat records, actually. Uh, my students did this back in the, um, like, around 2010. But uh, 
but it's not ideal. It's much better if you train the machine to uh, categorize lots and lots of categories. The more categories you ask it to classify, the better the representations, the more robust they are. The more general. The more general they are. Yeah. And so ultimately, why not train it to just encode the image, right? Don't try to classify. Just, just tell me like what are the useful, relevant uh, pieces of information in the image that will allow you to reconstruct that image. Maybe with uh, a little loss of details, but you know most of the information will be encoded. So that's the idea of an autoencoder, right? You have a neural net that takes an image, produces some sort of representation of that image, and then tries to reconstruct the image from the representation that's, that's an autoencoder. Um, so let, let, let's take the, the example of, of video prediction, right? So you, yeah. you give the machine a video clip, and you ask it what's going to happen next. Uh, and it cannot possibly predict exactly what's going to happen next because you know if it's a picture of someone talking, that person can say a word or another, can move uh, the head you know, in one direction or the other, and the system has no way to predict what's going what's to happen. The example I use very often is, uh, let's say you uh, have a video clip where you know, someone takes a, takes a pen and puts right. it on the table and you let the pen go. You know the pen is going to fall, but you can't really predict in what right. right direction. So, if you use, if you train a neural net to minimize the distance between the predicted image and the image that's observed, or the frame, you know, in the video, mm -hmm. it cannot do a good job. It will have to predict the average of all the possible futures, right. and that ends up being a blurry image. Um, it's a, you know, a, a superposition of of me moving my head to the left and to the right because right. it doesn't know if I'm going to move yeah. left or right. right. Uh, so you get blurry predictions. So one way to uh, uh, get around this problem is you, you 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 have an extra variable that you draw randomly. It's called a latent variable. You draw it randomly, and depending on the value that you draw, it's not a single variable. It's going to be a vector, right? So you, mm -hmm. depending on which values you draw, the prediction is going to change. And now the the game the name of the game now is to ch is to train that machine to make predictions uh, so that you know, as you draw different values of the certain variable, the predictions basically go through all the possible mm -hmm. futures in the video, right? Um, and the problem with this is that how can you tell the machine whether its prediction is, is good or not? To do that, you have to train a second neural net. And that neural net is trained to tell the difference between a good prediction and a bad mm -hmm. prediction. That's called a discriminator or a critic. Uh, and an adversarial generative adversarial network is the idea of training those two networks together. I see. So intentionally against each yeah. other, basically. Yeah. And uh, w when you're when you're talking about learning representations, for example, from watching uh, millions or hundreds of millions of videos, I asked Peter Abiel this: Where is that? Uh, knowledge, that learning stored, is it simply in the weights of the network? Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking network. about very big networks. It could be very, very big networks. Uh, what's right. the biggest network that you've worked on in this you well, know, representation so they, learning? You know, there is there is two numbers, right, in a in a neural net, or there is a number of different things you can how, you know and how you can describe the layers it. and the number. One is how many layers. One is you know how many neurons per layer, and yeah. what's the pattern yeah. of connection. And the other one is how many free parameters there are, like how many tunable parameters, Tunable, yeah. right? Because in conventional nets, you have one parameter controls multiple connections. Yeah. So, um, and you know, people in natural language, for example, you know, train routine model, train models that have a billion parameters. Wow. Um, so those are pretty big networks. Yeah. Uh, Convnets. Ma uh, many of them have a relatively small number of parameters, like it's in the tens of millions. You know, it's it's amazing to say now that it's actually yeah. a small number of parameters because. Um, if I project myself back 30 years ago, yeah. you know, a big network yeah. had you know, 60,000 parameters. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it could be extremely large because uh, sometimes you want, to apply, you want to apply the conventional net on a large image at high resolution so it can detect small objects anywhere in the image. And so the overall size of the network is gigantic, in fact. It's, right. you know, it could be tens, tens of billions of operations, maybe hundreds of billions. Yeah. Uh, talking again to Peter Abiel, uh, he was saying, yes, uh, the, the, the learning is stored in the weights, but there are also systems to store uh, experience in databases, and, yeah. and, uh, so that the, the system can refer 
in in effect, it's like a memory. Right. Yeah. Well, so that's actually a very interesting topic of, uh, of research now for a lot of people, which is um, basically uh, uh, sort of augmenting neural nets with some sort of working memory. Um, so if you want a neural net to do just perception, right? Perception mm -hmm. is sort of very sort of reactive thing. You know, you give an image, you go through a bunch of layers, and you get the answer. Uh, but a lot of tasks that we'd like machines to do involve reasoning or, or, or inference. Decision making, right? right. Um, well, everything is decision making. Yeah, but, I guess. But, yeah. but you know, several steps of reasoning, uh, referring to uh, past events, um, um, you know, things like that, like having a working memory, right? Um, where you can hold facts and things like that. So, you know, if I tell you a story, uh, and in fact, this is actually uh, kind of a scenario that people here at Facebook have uh, built uh, several years ago. It, uh, the story is uh, uh, John goes to the kitchen, John picks up the milk, uh, John goes to the den, uh, John drops the milk, uh, now John goes to the kitchen, uh, Jane goes to the den, and she picks up the milk. Uh, then she goes to the backyard and drops the milk. Where is the milk? Okay, so, you know, you have to, or, you know, how many people are in the kitchen, right? So, you know, you, you can listen to a story, you can uh, maintain a state of the world yeah. in, your, in your memory, which you have to keep somewhere, right? Uh, and then someone asks you a question and you have to kind of answer that question, so you have to kind of figure out what's the state of the world, uh, you know, Whereas the milk is easy to remember because I just told you that uh, Jane, you know, dropped it. Right. But like how many people are in the kitchen, you have to remember that John went back to the kitchen, right? Right. Um, and so, um, so there's a, a data set of this type that uh, Chisholm Weston, Antoine Board, and a couple others here built a few years ago called the Baby Tasks, which is exactly this kind of scenario. And they invented a, a, a particular type of neural net to solve this problem called the memory network. So it's basically a, a neural net recurrent neural net, yeah. and next to it is, is a memory, mm -hmm. um, but that memory is itself a neural net. Okay? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a special kind of neural net which is designed to kind of store data and, and, and retrieve it, basically. Very, and it's, you can think of it as a particular architecture of a neural mm -hmm. net. Uh, and every time step, the, when um, you know, the, the neural net kind of asks a question to the memory, sends a query to the memory, gets an answer back, and then as a function of the answer, Add something else to the memory and get the answer back, etc. And so now you can have a network that can do a chain of reasoning. Um, and then people have built on this idea a lot over the last uh, few years. The latest models that work best in uh, natural language understanding are called tra uh, transformer networks. And the transformer networks is sort of a network in which groups of neurons inside a network are basically those memory modules. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're very similar to those memory modules. So I think there's a, there's a lot of hope that uh, we're going to make progress uh, in AI because of ideas of this type. Uh, you you use this um, uh, <clears throat> this analogy uh, several times. I don't know when you first use it. I saw it in Long Beach of the gâteau génoise with right. the, the unsupervised. Learning as the cake and the yeah you mean this yes that one <laughs> uh, no, you don't want this. and the uh, uh, the supervised as the icing and the reinforcement as the uh, so right. uh, have are, are there systems that you've worked on that have have had this chain uh, <laughs> or or is the research still very discreet? People are working on unsupervised or people that are working on supervised or people on reinforcement? So the thing that has come the closest, at least in my work, I mean, there's a lot of people uh, at, at uh, Berkeley, for example, at Stanford, like um, Sergei Levine, Chelsea Finn, Peter Abiel, to some extent, right. and a few other people uh, at DeepMind at Facebook who, who've worked on uh, what's called model-based reinforcement learning systems, right? And it's not a new idea. People have, you know, have had this idea for a long time where uh, the system has kind of a predictive model of the world, mm -hmm. um, which allows it to predict, for example, you know, if I'm driving a car and next to a cliff and I turn the wheel to the right, I'm going to run off a cliff and nothing good is going to happen, right? I don't need to actually try. I know I have a model of the physics in, yeah. my, in my head that tells me this is bad. Um, and so there's quite a lot of activity now on model-based reinforcement learning. And it, it, 
it didn't happen too much in the past for the same reason that people resisted using deep learning for a long time, which is that the theory doesn't work. So the theory tells you, you know, there's a proof that model free reinforcement learning will converge in certain conditions, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's no such proof for model based. And experimentally, if you don't do it right, model based reinforcement learning learns faster, but it doesn't work as well as model free. Mm. Uh, and so that caused people in the mid 90s, at the same time that people abandoned neural nets for simpler models, they also abandoned model based reinforcement learning for model free. Mm. Um, uh, and this, this is joke about like, it, it's, um, it's a popular joke in in France, you know, the, the French-like mathematics, right? Mm. And the, the joke is, um, yeah, 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 it works in practice, but does it actually work in theory? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, yeah. you know, the whole community essentially had this attitude that, uh, yeah, it works in practice, but we, won't under we don't understand why, and yeah. we don't think we have good theoretical ways to understand why, so we're just not going to work on it anymore. Yeah. In my opinion, this is, you know, looking for your lost car keys under the street light, even though you lost yeah, it someplace right. else. Yeah. Um, so, another joke. Um, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so this model-based reinforcement learning, I think, is is becoming really interesting, particularly for people who work on robotics, because it's very hard to train a robotic system in simulation for things like grasping, because simulators are not very good. Um, um, so, so there's a lot of interest. My own work, uh, I try to stay away from reinforcement learning. I like uh, because I like the efficiency of gradient-based learning and reinforcement learning, you know, basically you can't use gradients because you can't estimate the gradient of the objective function. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, you can estimate it, but you can't compute it directly. Mm -hmm. So I've done things like uh, our latest paper at iClear um, just uh, a month ago was, was about the idea of uh, training a, a predictive model of what cars around you are going to do. Um, so you can run this model uh, for several steps, maybe several seconds, and it will uh, predict what the cars around you are going to do. And of course, you know you can't exactly predict. So there is some rent, you know some variable you can sure. draw, and it will predict multiple futures. There's a cost function you can compute, which is how far you are from the other cars, whether they're going to bump into you, whether you are in your lane or not, you know whether you are going at the speed you want, you know various uh, costs like this. And um, and what you can do is train a neural net to uh, produce the correct, the best uh, steering policy and braking accelerating policy so as to minimize the mm -hmm. likelihood of, of collision uh, by just minimizing this cost. And so you're using this model to predict what's, what the future is going uh, is going to do. You have a cost function that's, that's differentiable and you just train a neural net to you know, optimize this, uh, this objective. There's no reinforcement learning. It does the same thing that a lot of people try to do with reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. But because the cost function is differentiable, there's no, no need for reinforcement learning. There's certainly generalization going on, but uh, it's, it's generalization that's fairly uh, narrow. I mean, because yeah. it's generalization within one data set. That's right. right. You have the training data, then you pull out a test data, mm -hmm. and it generalizes from the training to the test data. But if you use a s different data set, it usually doesn't work. So there, there, that's one question is, is how do you get to that generalization? And then the other question is, uh, is there real transfer learning going on anywhere where the learning that's stored mm -hmm. in, the, in the weights can actually be applied to a new problem? Well, so, um, I mean, transfer learning works, right? So if you have a big data set, regardless of what the task is for image recognition, you pre-train on this data set, and then you fine-tune on whatever data you have, which may be smaller, right? So this kind of stuff works. You still need data for the, the, the second problem. One thing that people are trying to do is, um, uh, is sort of multitask learning. So you train a, a neural net on multiple data sets, and you hope to get some sort of more generic um, image recognizer, whatever it is. And then it's easier to specialize it for a particular task because it's learned already a lot of different uh, uh, tasks. So that's one thing that Facebook has been doing, for example, where you take, um, I don't know, 4 billion images from Instagram, um, where people, you know, when they post a picture on Instagram, they, they put hashtags. Right. And so what the Facebook uh, people did was um, select the 17,000 most 
frequent hashtags that correspond to actual objects, physical concepts, uh, and then train a, a neural net on those 4 billion images to predict which of the 17,000 hashtags are present. And you know it does a pretty terrible job at it, but but it learns to represent images in such a way that it can do that prediction as mm. as, as well as it can. Then you chop off the last layer and you fine tune the the network on ImageNet, Coco, whatever task that you're interested in, and you can beat records mm. this way. Um, uh, this was a, a paper published last year, and and so that that's a sort of edging towards kind of almost unsupervised learning in the sense that the data is not carefully curated. Mm -hmm. It's just whatever people type for, for hashtags. Um, but ultimately, what you want to do is, is self-supervised learning. So you know, um, I'm not giving you hashtags. I'm just, you know, here are pictures. You can have as many billions as you want. Encode pictures um, in such a way that the features that would be elaborated by the system then would be useful for any task, any vision task that you can imagine. That's the that's the challenge really of uh, self-supervised learning. Uh, ultimately, the goal is to uh, knit together all these different techniques and strategies mm -hmm. into general artificial intelligence. Is that something that you <laughs> stay away from, or do you have no. an opinion about? Okay, well, I have a lot of opinion on this, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, first of all, I don't like the term AGI, Artificial yeah, General Intelligence. I've been, I've been corrected on that point before. Uh, yeah. uh, because human intelligence is actually very specialized. We like to yeah. think of ourselves as being general intelligent. We're not. We're very specialized machines. Mm -hmm. um, so AGI is a misnomer. Mm -hmm. um, human level intelligence, that's a, that's a better question to ask. So, can, you know, could we build machines at some point that will be as intelligent as humans in all the tasks that humans are intelligent in. Um, and the answer is, of course, there's no question. It's a, it's a matter of time. Hmm. Um, and, and it's very important to make progress in that direction because we'd like to have machines that have some level of common sense mm -hmm. because we'd like to be able to build you know, virtual assistants that help people in their daily lives. Um, can answer any question you you have, you know. Can kind of manage your interaction with the digital world and and with each other. Um, uh, so that you know that would be kind of transformative in terms of uh, technology that's available. We'd like uh, image recognition systems that don't get easily fooled. We'd like uh, self-driving cars that are very robust. And you know that understand how the world works enough that you know they make the right decisions when they see unusual situations. Um, so that's a really important question for practical reasons. Um, and then the question is, you know, how is it that um, you know the best of our AI systems have less common sense than a house cat mm -hmm. or actually a rat? <laughs> you know, a Washington Square Park rat. Yeah. Um, there is something that. You know, animals. Some learning process that animals have uh, access to to acquire all the knowledge they have about the world that we don't have in our machines. Uh, so one hypothesis, or my money is on things like self-supervised learning, but you know there might be other uh, other favorite approaches by, from other people. Uh, so so it's a very important problem to solve um, for machines to learn by observation, uh, learn without requiring too many label samples. Uh, perhaps accumulate enough background knowledge by observation that some sort of common sense will emerge, um, and we'll have you know not just intelligent virtual assistants, we'll have dexterous robots, you know, you know the household robots that everybody sure. has been dreaming of, yeah. dreaming of, right? We don't have the technology today, right? Uh, right. So yeah, that's a you know very very intriguing question. There's a lot of people at Facebook working a on a question, this. but one that you're optimistic can be answered. We, yeah, I mean, there's no question it can be answered. It's a matter of how much, you know, how long is it going to take and yeah. how is it going to be done.